Ma'am, you're good. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm Betsy, a representative of Fogel, but you can call me Betsy. I am a freshman legislator from Springfield, Missouri. You can see my current house district map. Um, so let's see, we are currently like right around here, OTC's campus. So I have pretty much central East Springfield in my current house district. We just went through a process called redistricting, which is where the state divides up new house district maps. So the 135th, which I currently represent, does look a little bit different. I lost all of my South of Sunshine, for those of you who know where that street is picked up Missouri State Campus, so if I am lucky enough to be reelected in November, I'll get to serve as the representative for Missouri State. And then I have all the way to the north city limit and all the way to the east city limit. So I picked up some of the suburban parts of the city out on the north side and over on the east side of town. So I, like I said, I'm a freshman legislator, which just means I am in my first term. For those of you who don't know, I'm sure you've studied this, but in the House of Reps here in Missouri, you can serve four to your term. So I'm in the second year of my first term. And in the Senate, you can serve two four-year terms. So you can serve a total of 16 years in that house and in the Senate combined. And our state capital is in Jefferson City. Have any of you been there? Have any of you been to the capital? Just a quick show of hands. Awesome, like third grade field trip or because you went and advocated? I'm seeing a lot of like field trip situations, okay. So my background um, and why I ran for office, I'll talk about that quickly and then open it up for any questions. I'm born and raised here in Springfield, and about 10 years ago I was sitting in the seats you guys are sitting in, just on the campus at Missouri State. I did my undergraduate in the field of sociology uh, at Missouri State, went down, I see a mask, go Bears, I think that's a Missouri State yeah, mask, it isn't is. it? Yes. <laughs> and then went down to the University of Arkansas, where I got my master's also in the field of sociology. So for those of you who may or may not know, sociology is just kind of the study of people, social inequalities, how do we make our community stronger and better. That needed me a job in public health, so I worked at Jordan Valley Community Health Center. Anybody know what that is? Seeing some yeses. Some of you may even use that for your health care. Um, worked there for about six years prior to being elected. In my first two years there, I operated as a social worker in the clinic. So I met with families, did Medicaid applications, housing applications, food applications, anything that you can think a family living in poverty might need to be successful. That was my job to, can help, to help connect patients. After doing that for a few years and being the person who, when somebody walks in and they're having a mental health crisis or are ready to make a change and maybe suffering from addiction but want to get clean, and being the person in the clinic to have to tell that person no because they don't have health insurance is kind of what first got me interested in public policy and made me want to run for office later on. There's only so much you can do downstream, right? There's only so much you can do when you're meeting with families individually to make really substantive change. And I just, quite frankly, got sick and tired of being the person to tell people they couldn't afford health care, they couldn't get housing, they couldn't get transportation. I don't know if any of you take public transit here in Springfield, but it's quite frustrating if you're on the bus trying to get to and from campus and it takes you three hours to get from your house to school and another three hours to get back home. Those are kind of all the problems that I started seeing in our community. And when the opportunity presented itself to run for office, I jumped in, uh, I put my name on the ballot, knocked thousands of doors, and then COVID hit. And of course that shut everything down, so I didn't get to knock any doors from March of, well, gosh, I'm getting my years, 19, 20, up and through the election, um, just because COVID was here, and that presented an incredibly different set of unique challenges. And running a first campaign in a time when you couldn't get together and fundraise and you couldn't knock doors was, quite challenging, but I think lent itself well to somebody who had a background in healthcare during a global pandemic to be at the table and start making these decisions about what we should do as a state, what we should do as a municipality. So I ran a very strong campaign and was elected um, in November of 2020. I beat an incumbent Republican. I was the only person to flip a district from red to blue or blue to, uh, blue to red, which was a, a pretty big deal and I'm very proud of my team for doing the work. Um, but. Obviously, here in the state of Missouri, for those of you who follow along, we live in a state where we are dominated by Republicans. So I don't know any of the political affiliations of any of you in this room, but practically what that means is in Jeff City, Republicans can file a bill, they can pass it out of the House, over to the Senate, and it can be signed by the governor without needing a single Democratic vote. And why that's challenging, of course, is Democrats and Republicans oftentimes have very different priorities. And when there's so few Democrats, it's hard for us to get our priorities moving and we oftentimes are playing defense. So something that I'm really passionate about is public education. I don't want to take dollars away from our public schools. I don't want to privatize education. I think public education is a cornerstone of strong communities, and it really scares me when my Republican counterparts start talking about privatizing education. 
but because there are so few Democrats, it makes it, when I'm in Jeff City, I'm oftentimes playing defense instead of offense, right? I can file all the bills I want, but my bills never get referred, and our votes we have to be very strategic about how we partner with Republicans, when do we give them, for example, I have four or five bills that I wrote that I handed off to Republicans because they have the opportunity to pass them in a way that me as a member of the minority party can't do. Um, and then also sometimes that means standing up on the House floor for two or three hours fighting against something that I don't believe in and my caucus and I, because there's so few of us, we're on the House floor a lot with our hands in the air trying to get the speaker to call on us so we can fight against some of the things that are important to us in our call meetings. So that's a little bit about me, how I came to run for office, what I do in the day to day, and I'd love to take questions or if there's anything I said that you want to know more about, I'd love to tell you that too. Before we do that, um, on top of everything else, why the Democratic Party? Why do you identify with them and not some other party? That's a, a great question, and my family oftentimes asks me that question because I come from a long line of Republicans. So you can imagine that makes for some really interesting Christmas get-togethers and holidays um, when my family will, quite frankly, be like, what in the world are you thinking running as a Democrat? Um, but so I kind of want to make two comments to that. You know, we live in a time where politics are so polarizing, and I'm sure when you guys turn on the news, it makes you mad to see the these two political parties seem to want to do nothing other than fight against each other. The reality of the situation in Jeff City is that though we have very polarizing and different opinions on what things, what legislation we should pass or what our priorities should be, there is so much bipartisan work that gets done behind the scenes, but newspapers don't pick that up and TVs don't cover it because it's not as exciting to watch, right? But politics aren't nearly as polarizing as, as people would want you to believe, and there's a lot of great work that gets done behind the scenes. I'm a Democrat because I believe that the role of government is not only to make my life better, but to make the lives of the people around me better, and I think the Democrats have a path of doing that. I believe in, and I reign as a Democrat because I believe in access to health care for all Missourians, regardless of your ability to pay for it. I believe in a strong public education system because I think that every child, regardless of zip code, should have the chance to be successful. And I believe in Missouri being a state where all feel welcome, regardless of race, sexual orientation, class, or anything else that may matter. And I'm not saying there aren't Republicans that also feel that way, but that's kind of the core of why I'm a Democrat and why I chose to run as a Democrat back in 2019. Okay, so can we go back to Jeff City for a minute? Absolutely. Because Jeff City, for the past week and a half, has been <laughs> crazy town. Yeah. Okay, so here's the general skeletal understanding that I have. Please help us understand what the heck is going on. We have been going through, maybe it's concluded by now, a week-long filibuster that my understanding is it's been Republicans filibustering Republicans. What on earth is going on and is it resolved? Great question. And this, so I said my mom's a Republican and she oftentimes shares her opinions with me. And even as a Republican, she texted me yesterday and she said, gosh, I'm so sick of our taxpayer dollars being wasted on Republicans fighting with each other and all this filibustering going on. But the back story of that is we are in the process of passing congressional maps. So that means a delegation that represents us in Washington, D.C. They don't do the maps here in the state. There's a bipartisan commission that draws my maps. But we as a legislature decide what the maps are going to look like for a congressional delegation in D.C. So the House passed a map that is a 6-2 leaning map. So what that means is if you look at the raw data, the probability of there being six Republicans and two Democrats being sent to Washington, D.C. is very high. We passed that out of the House pretty unanimously. Then the Senate got a hold of it. In the Senate, there's what's called a conservative caucus, and then there's the Republican caucus. That conservative caucus exists within the entirety of the Republican caucus and prides themselves on being the most conservative members of the legislature. There's seven members of that conservative caucus. So they have spent the last week and a half filibustering this 6-2 map because in their minds, they believe that Missouri should have a 7-1 map, that we should send seven Republicans to D.C. and only one Democrat. There are a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans who would disagree with that because when you look at the percent of voters in Missouri, we have about 40 to 45 percent of people who identify as Democrats and the rest as Republicans. So having a map that only gives us one Democrat in D.C. isn't a fair representation from a lot of our perspectives on what that uh, representation should look like. So what you're seeing over in the Senate, who has the ability to filibuster, do you guys know what filibuster means, I'm sure? I mean, you can stand up there and talk for as long as you want about whatever you want. So they've been reading books, they've been acting out skits, they've been taking song requests and singing on the house floor just to kill time. There is no resolution. They kind of paused it, they came back to work and did a few bills in the meantime, but they will get back to it because that conservative caucus 
and the rest of the Senate just cannot come to an agreement on what that congressional map should look like, which means lots of late nights for the Senate and uh, lots of song requests coming from the audience, which is quite silly, uh, but how they pass the time. What are your favorite song requests that you've heard? Oh gosh, they did like Call Me, Call Me Maybe, Call Me Baby, whatever that song is. <laughs> lots of songs from the 70s, yeah. a lot of rock songs. Um, yeah, it's been quite entertaining for those of us who don't have to stay up all night and see it on the Senate floor. Here in this class, we saw Ted Cruz reading Green Eggs and Ham on, on the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. That's much better singing songs. <laughs> all right, yeah. so uh, your background is in uh, health care. Yes. Let's start off with two health care questions. This one specifically comes from Joshua Brom of a Tuesday, Thursday class that I have. What are your feelings on mask mandates for public schools? I know it's a local issue, but this is your bread and butter, so. It is a local issue. So over the last two years, I'm gonna speak kind of globally on what we've seen happen with the COVID pandemic and some of my frustrations stemming from that. I think we can all agree that COVID is a serious thing, right? Regardless of what political spectrum you live in, we may disagree on the severity of the virus, we may disagree on how to handle it. But we know if you look at the data, the number of hospitalizations we've had, the number of deaths we've had here in the state of Missouri, we were facing a, a pandemic. And I do believe that those decisions on whether or not someone should have a mask mandate are best made at the local level. And Springfield was a really interesting microcosm of that. We had some school board members who wanted a mask mandate, some who didn't. We had a mask mandate for part of the school year. And then we had a conversation about should we go back to it when case numbers started to rise again. What was interesting about this year is our attorney general came in and sued all of these school districts who were having mask mandates because he didn't want them to have mask mandates. And, and to be clear, what is an attorney general? The attorney general is our state's legal counsel who, whose job it is is to defend state employees, defend the state against litigation, does a lot of work in um, prosecuting sex trafficking and human trafficking. Basically the, the chief general counsel for the state is how I would explain what the attorney general does. So he came in, sent all these cease and desist letters to schools saying, if you do not remove your mask mandate, we will continue litigation against your school district. And whether or not that was the right decision, whether or not masks are good things or bad things in public schools, my frustration with how that played out is that I do believe local school boards who are locally elected, accountable to the people that they serve, are best suited to make those decisions, not the Attorney General in Jefferson City. In terms of, do I believe in mask mandates? I think that there's a time and a place for them, and I know we're all sitting here in this classroom right now, I know you guys have a mask mandate. It's honestly quite shocking to be in a room of people with masks, because in Jeff City, there's maybe a handful of us that wear them regularly. But I think that there's a time and a place for them, and when our hospitals are full, and when our schools are closing because teachers aren't well enough to teach our children, and kids don't have a safe place to go during the day, and parents are having to call off work. I don't know if any of you have kids in the SPS system or any school districts around here. But it's hard to get a call on Thursday that your schools are gonna be shut down for a week because you don't have enough teachers well enough to teach our kids. I think that's an appropriate and proper time to have a mask mandate. I don't want it to be something that we're facing indefinitely just because, um, people prefer masks, but I think that when we look at talking to our local public health agencies, talking to our hospital leadership, talk, talking to the people who understand infection prevention, they are best suited to make those decisions at the local level, and I trust um, the individuals who we've, we've elected to make those choices. Uh, well, first of all, there's no mask mandate in the Capitol right now? No. We have never had a mask mandate in the Capitol. So probably the number one question we have received from our various students has been on Medicaid expansion. Now Medicaid, just for anybody, Medicaid is government health insurance largely for the impoverished. This Medicaid expansion has had a little bit of a rocky road in Missouri. Could you describe the rocky road and where are we right now? Yes, so I'm glad you brought up Medicaid expansion. This is the reason that I ran for office. You know, when I, when I started talking to you guys a few minutes ago, I said I was sick and tired of being the person who had to tell people they couldn't get health care, right? What happens here in the state of Missouri is we have this gap of people who don't qualify for insurance and maybe you're working full time, but their insurance doesn't cover it. Do any of you, you don't have to share, do any of you work in jobs where you're working full time or almost full time and they don't offer affordable health insurance, right? So Medicaid expansion is to cover this gap of people so they can get medical, dental, behavioral health services for individuals who meet certain income thresholds. It's separate from Medicare, which is age-based, and we all pay into and we're all eligible for, regardless of need. Medicaid is for those who live in poverty. So back in August of 2020, it went on 
uh, through an initiative petition. Do you guys know what that is when people, you collect signatures and things go on the ballot because you're able to get enough signatures. So it was on the ballot in August of 2020 and it passed with 53.5% of the vote. So that meant that the legislature had to give money to cover the cost of all these newly eligible people in the state's Medicaid system. Fast forward a year, I'm on the budget committee. Our budget chair decides to not give money to cover the cost of Medicaid expansion of these individuals who have been faking on this health care, been pushing off surgeries and going to the doctor and seeing a mental health provider, thinking they were going to get this coverage. Our budget chair decides, nope, we're not going to do it. We're not going to give any money for, to cover those people. We'll still cover pregnant people, children, but we're not going to cover this newly eligible group of people. So the budget passes out of the House, passes out of the Senate without those dollars in there. Fast forward another few months, the Supreme Court takes the case up and says, no, Missouri, you have to cover the cost of these, of these newly eligible people. So with that Supreme Court ruling, about 200,000 Missourians became eligible for health care who previously couldn't have it. So now, this was in August of 2021, and the Supreme Court said you have a few months to be able to get this program up and running and start processing applications. People started getting approved for Medicaid expansion in October. That's all great. People, we have unfortunately long backlogs of how many people are waiting. It's taking about two months for people to hear back on if they're eligible. That's a workforce crisis conversation that we can talk about later. But then what we happened this year is our budget chair yet again introduced a bill, brought it up in committee that said, moving forward, we don't want to pay for Medicaid expansion and we want to go in and change the constitution to make it to where the general assembly, meaning us as legislators, can determine whether or not we want to provide dollars for these 200, 250,000 people to get health care. So from the outside looking in, really what that means is you guys as the voters, however many of you voted in August of 2020, told us as a legislature what you wanted. You said we want these Missourians to have health care. We know that it's going to bring billions of dollars to our state. It's going to help keep rural hospitals open. It's going to create jobs. We want all these people to be happy, healthy, and have access to health care. And we as a general assembly said, we don't care what you think, we're gonna do what we think is best, even though you already told us, it passed by a majority of vote, that you wanted these individuals to have health care. So as somebody who, this is the reason why I left a job that I loved, and this is the singular issue that I'm most passionate about, it's been incredibly frustrating for at every turn, some of my colleagues to say, this isn't what's best, we know what's best. We want Missourians, we don't care what you said at the ballot box, we're gonna do whatever we want anyway. And on a quick aside, what's also been really interesting this year is not only how we tried to defund Medicaid expansion, but you've seen, we've seen over 25 bills filed that changed that initiative petition process to make it harder for the next time you guys wanna do something as the citizens to get something passed outside of us as the General Assembly. Um, one more question on uh, health for, what I would like to do is I, I would like to open up the room, anybody that might be interested in asking you questions Absolutely. directly. You don't always get an opportunity to yell at somebody who represents you. Why not give them, <laughs> why not give them that opportunity? But uh, I also, I, I, before I do that, there was a, just a great question by Emma Smith. We need to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. Her question's phrased confusingly, just take it any direction you want okay. to. She says, being a member of a subcommittee on appropriations, what is your take on how many mental health facilities with higher risk patients treat those under their care? So really just take mental health in any direction you see fit. Okay, so I think, Again, regardless of political ideology, regardless if you're involved in politics, most people can agree that we're, as a society, facing a mental health crisis, right? I know I, I have family members who are struggling for mental health issues, substance use issues. I don't think that there's a family in the United States that doesn't know or care for somebody who needs access to mental health services. Primarily and specifically, when we talk about our children, COVID has done a lot of terrible things to our society, one of which is really impacting the, the mental health of the children in our school systems. So as a General Assembly and as a member of the Budget Committee, that's one of the areas I'm very passionate about is making sure that everybody has access to care when they need it. What does not work is if somebody's in a crisis, a mental health crisis, and they walk into a doctor's office or they walk into a hospital and that person says, okay, great, you can have care, but you can have it in six months. Right? That's not how mental health works. When you're having a crisis and you need therapy, you need to get it at that moment. Same with substance use. I don't know if any of you know anybody or maybe you're, you yourself have struggled with addiction. When you're ready to make a change, if you don't have doors open for you in that moment, that's six more months, that's six more years of you struggling with addiction if you don't have those services in front of you. And so that's something we spend a lot of time talking about 
in the legislature is how do we provide that care to people when they need it and when they're ready? And how do we make sure that we have providers that can provide those services in schools, in rural Missouri? Another example of something that doesn't work is if you live in a small town in Missouri and it takes you two hours to get to a doctor's office, right? That's not feasible. So how do we get innovative? How do we make sure that we do things like telemedicine to where you connect with a provider maybe virtually? That works for some people, right? That doesn't work for everybody. How do we make sure we have behavioral health specialists embedded in schools? So when you have a third grader who keeps acting out, you don't send that kid home, you send that kid to somebody who's trained in mental health services and can provide those services on site. Unfortunately, in the state of Missouri, we are one of the last ranked in terms of access to mental health services, which is something that my colleagues and I are very, very uh, passionate about. How do we increase the number of behavioral crisis centers? I don't know if you guys know this, but we have one here in the city um, that is run by Burrell. So police officers, if they encounter somebody who's having a mental health crisis instead of taking them to jail, which is an inappropriate use of the police officer's time and the jail's time, right? You can take them to this behavioral crisis center where they can get that on-site immediate care. How do we replicate that throughout the state? How do we make sure that everybody has access when they need it? And we are leaps and bounds from being where we need to be, um, but it's a conversation that is starting to have more bipartisan support and I look forward to seeing what we can get done. Anybody have any questions or thoughts for Representative Fogel while we have her here? Um, so I know, sorry, I know that like currently in our nation, like there's been a lot of the discussion around the Roe v. Wade decision in the Supreme Court. I just am wondering, has, how has that decision um, affected like women's rights specifically in Missouri? And like, has that had a good or a bad effect on women's rights? So reproductive rights is one of the most contentious things that we talk about as a General Assembly, as you can imagine. It is one of those issues that both, cam or both sides of political spectrums campaign on. And I'll just give an example. So when I ran for office my first time two years ago, I received in my own mailbox 12 mailers that were against me as a candidate. One of them had a picture of me holding a baby that was crying and said, like, you know, Betsy wants to kill babies. So I preface that to say I know how sincere and genuine and how hard this conversation can be for some people to have regardless of which side of the aisle, which side of the aisle that you sit on. So here in Missouri we have already very restrictive um, laws in regards to access to reproductive rights or reproductive services. We, in the last calendar year, had about 40 medical abortions that were provided in the state because our laws are already so conservative. But what happens is Missourians who are in need of those services or are wanting to seek those services oftentimes go out of state. So as Missouri's abortion numbers went down, what you saw was Illinois went up by the same proportionate amount. So though we're restricting it here in the state of Missouri, that oftentimes doesn't affect how many people are, are wanting to seek those services or able to seek those services. But what ends up happening is only families or only individuals who have certain income levels who can drive to other states are able to receive those services. I know, I'm sure probably some of you followed the legislation that happened in Texas last year. They passed um, some pretty sweeping anti-abortion bills. Those have been filed in the House and we've started to hear some of those. I would not be surprised if some of those made it out of the House to the Senate. Um, and I know that will be one of the most contentious conversations we have this year, even independent of Roe versus Wade. Of course, there's a lot of people watching what happens at the federal level, but here in Missouri, our, our laws are already so, I'll use the word conservative, um, that we don't have a, a lot of room to lose access to reproductive just or reproductive rights. If I can piggyback off her question, Missouri has uh, several years back passed the heartbeat bill. What's a heartbeat bill? And my understanding is it is not in effect right now. What, what is it? So the bill basically drops the time of which a, a woman who's seeking abortion services can get it. Depending on which state you live in, there are different rules. Some it's six weeks, some it's 12 weeks, some much higher than that. So several years ago, Missouri passed its most sweeping legislation related to abortion access. And it has been held up in court. Um, oftentimes what you see happen is Missouri passes legislation at the state level that's contradictory or not constitutional at the federal level. We have several examples of that happening here in this state with legislation that we passed last year. But that would be an example of the state law not matching the federal law and there being a conflict until it's settled in court. Uh, other questions? Yeah. So this is kind of like a broad question, but like what is your opinion on, on the controversial safe smoking kits that was 
funded by the Biden administration. The what? I'm sorry. The, the safe smoking kits, like, that's been, like, in the news about, like, what's your opinion on that? So I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying I try really hard not to give too much opinion on what's happening at the federal level because I try to hone in on what we're doing here at the state level. Um, and to be honest, I don't know a ton about the topic that you're referring to. Um, How much in terms of um, drug abuse treatment did you oversee in your role with uh, Jordan Valley? Yeah, so at Jordan Valley, every day we had people that would come in to get care who were addicted to opiates, addicted to heroin, addicted to meth, all, all sorts of things. We know that Southwest Missouri is one of the most per capita in terms of individuals who struggle with addiction, and that is absolutely heartbreaking, and we need to do everything we can on the prevention side to make sure that that's not a problem moving forward. Last year, the state of Missouri passed the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a statewide program where providers who are prescribing opiates to people go in and register how many opiates that individual is getting, because what you would see oftentimes is somebody going from provider to provider to get those um, very highly addictive medications. So that was kind of the first thing that we did at the statewide level to ensure that individuals weren't prescribed or weren't provider hopping, getting those um, medications. That bill itself had been filed for over 10 years, so I think there could be an argument made that we're kind of, we kind of missed the mark on when that would have been more helpful. Um, but again, that's one of the biggest issues facing our communities is drugs coming in, uh, you know, children getting addicted from a very young age because they were they broke a shoulder and they were prescribed opiates. And then that becomes, you can get addicted so quickly. Uh, so again, making sure we have those routine checks at doctor's offices, uh, making sure there's some legislation filed this year that would make mandatory CDC recommendations for providers here in the state of Missouri that are prescribing opiates. So there's a lot we can do, I think, around uh, the substance use problem. But again, it all goes back to the right level of care at the right time at the right cost. So uh, let's, I, I want to get to a question from uh, Ashley Fennewold, one of my online students. Uh, she asked if she, meaning you, uh, were willing to push for a higher teacher salary. Just in terms of context, Missouri, please ma'am correct me if I'm wrong, is 50th mm -hmm. out of 50 in teacher pay. And I'm talking about uh, public school pay. Yes. Not uh, but anyways, 50th out of 50. Now, the, the governor just gave a, gave a state of the state address where he talked about where he wanted that go, to go up, but that he needed help doing it from school districts. What, how would you fix this problem Absolutely. if you were emperor of Missouri? If I was, yeah, we live in a much different state if I was emperor of Missouri, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so to your point right now, our, our teachers here in the state of Missouri are paid very disproportionately in comparison to other states in our region and other states across the United States. In a time where there's a workforce shortage all across the board, right? I'm sure you guys are seeing the same things that I'm seeing. When I drive down the street, everywhere is hiring, right? No one can get enough workers and education is no different. And then add on to that how divisive public education has become over the last two years. Again, I'm sure some of you are consumers of the newspaper, of social media, of the news. We are facing a time where school teachers, public school teachers, are oftentimes villainized because of what they're teaching, what they're not teaching, are they requiring masks, are they not requiring masks. Public education has become this very controversial thing in a way that it never was before. So when we're talking about teachers who are going into the classroom and spending their lives educating the next generation of students, and put on top of that, again going back to what we talked about earlier, all the mental health struggles that our children are facing, that is a tough job. No one who is teaching has it easy, right? That requires a commitment to kids, it requires a commitment to academics. It's not easy. And we have a lot of teachers in the state who, are, who could go make more at a warehouse working at Amazon than they could in the classroom, or could make more when working in the fast food industry than they do in the classroom. And we need qualified public education teachers to make sure that the next generation of Missourians are educated. The governor did release um, guidance and some funding to raise the base rate for teacher pay up to 38000 which is a great first step. The downside is there are already school districts like Springfield, for example, that base rate pay is already over that 38000 So I think an unintended consequence, what you'll see is all these rural school districts will lift up their base to 38000 and now there won't be an incentive to go to some of these larger school districts who have always been more competitive because they paid above that amount. 
So we have to do more to retain and attract public educators. The number one reason that teachers left the profession in the last two years was not pay, shockingly. It was a lack of respect that they felt for themselves in their profession. So I think these two things go hand in hand. We have to increase teacher pay. Right now we have $2.9 billion sitting in our state treasury. I would argue that we have the money to do that already. But in that and with that, we have to marry that with the public perception of education, how we support our teachers, how we provide the services that they need, how we support the mental health needs of our students. I'll give a quick example. My little sister is a teacher in the Inman School District down in uh, Nixa, or uh, Inman in the Nixa School District. And every day she tells me stories about a child who threatened her, who um, tried to commit suicide in the classroom, who you know punched another student. All of these things our teachers are expected to handle in a ratio of one to 30. And we have to do better to support them both financially and emotionally, or we are going to continue to see a mass exodus from the education sphere. Questions for uh, Representative Fogel before we continue on? Ma'am, it's your floor. So you talked about how um, there's been a lot of pushback with medical expansion, and since you're on that budget committee, since that money isn't going towards uh, Medicaid expansion, where is that money going to? So currently, in this fiscal year, the Supreme Court told us we did have to cover the cost of Medicaid expansion. So we just passed what's called an emergency supplemental out of the budget to fully fund Medicaid and all of the populations that are eligible, including the Medicaid expansion population for the next fiscal year. If the legislation passes, it undoes the will of the voters that would take, into, take in effect years um, to come. What's interesting about Medicaid expansion is that, yes, it does cost some money up front, but in the long term, it's a cost savings to the state. We bring in the federal government, incentivizes us, and gives us extra money to encourage states who haven't expanded Medicaid to do so. Again, it's cost savings in when you're talking about prison time, police time, because all these people who didn't have access to health care or weren't on medications that stabilized their mood or stabilized their underlying mental health uh, diagnoses now have access to those services or are able to be contributing members of society. It's been shown to reduce the amount of children that are taken out of homes and put into foster care because again, those same parents who couldn't get the health care that they needed now are able to and are able to be more productive in the workplace. So if you look at the studies, Medicaid expansion ultimately ends up costing or, or bringing more money into the state than it does costing it outside of that initial startup cost, uh, which we'll pay for this year. Let's stay on the topic of drugs, shall we? We've got a question from Jose Guerra, um, a Tuesday, Thursday student. He says, I'm a college student in Springfield. In Missouri, you can get a medical card for medical marijuana. Do you support them making marijuana completely legal like it is in California, I'm sorry, Colorado, and other states? And if you don't, why not? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this and also not answer this, which is you know typical elected official answer to say. <laughs> I think that that decision is best made by the people of Missouri. I support that going on the ballot. I'm supporting us as a legislature passing what's called the House Joint Resolution to get this issue on a ballot out in front of all of Missourians um, so you guys can make the decision because I think 